a lot of you are going to hear a bit of a repeat, but I'm going to reintroduce myself and reintroduce our speakers since this is part two of our deep dive into the affordable housing finance presentation. My name is Alexandra Bartos O'Neill. I'm an associate at Oric Harrington in Suff Sutcliffe, and I am doing some brief moderating, gentle moderating of this panel and presentation here today. Uh, for part two of our presentation, we are focused on creative solutions and opportunities using tax-exempt housing bonds. And our main speakers and presenters for this today are Mike Schrader, for a senior partner at Ori Carrington and Sutcliffe, and Jessica Woodruff, our chief development officer at Community Development Partners. All right, well, with that, I will turn it over to you all. Thanks, Alex. Um, we've asked Natasha to stand by for any hard questions. So, uh, <laughs> Natasha. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we want to talk about some opportunities uh, here. I think really just kind of four categories. We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about recycled volume cap bonds on this. And really delighted to have Jessica join us to talk about their project and uh, how they made that work. And again, opportunities looking forward on that. We're also going to spend a fair amount of time talking about 501c3 bonds, uh, which is again a way to generate long-term tax-exempt interest through the use of a nonprofit. There's various ways to create that entity, and I think we're seeing, some again, some interesting developments across the country. I want to talk a little bit about capital market executions as opposed to bank direct purchase uh, transactions on this, and just share with you some of the things that we're seeing and trends that may be out there as well. And then in terms of wrapping up, I want to talk about some potential public-private partnerships or really community collaboration efforts that we're seeing that are underway as well, and a couple of things that we actually have seen that we think have uh, a tremendous potential for replication on that. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica and have her talk about uh, the Mahonia Crossing. I think it was called something else when we actually did the deal. Uh, uh, <laughs> we did the transaction. I'm going to have Jessica talk about that, walk you through some of the details, then we're going to wrap up and talk a little bit about some of the mechanics associated with recycled uh, bond cap. I know we had a question in the first session, and thank you so many of you for staying and did not walking out after the first session, so thanks for being here for part two uh, on this. But again, this note, this, um, and this really, again, this arises from the short-term use of volume cap for 50% LIHTC purposes. So Jessica, let me have you talk about your project. Thank you. Yes, it was called Gateway before. Um, so <laughs> thanks for inviting me to speak about this project. Uh, I'll explain how we got to recycling bonds. Um, and it was really, so this project in Salem is a lift-only wildfire project. So when I think back, it was around, uh, it was June of last year when I've been working in affordable housing around the tax credit you know, space for 19 years. So this is the first new construction, 129 units, uh, that with the, the lift award from OHCS, uh, I was gonna do a new construction project with no tax credits, and I thought, this is gonna be so easy. <laughs> uh, and of course, why the, the application was in, like everybody knows, construction costs were going up, interest rates were going up, and this project was supposed to just be lift, so roughly $25 million of lift, so a huge investment of lift wildfire funds with a construction and a perm loan. So it sounded super easy. Um, and one of the challenges that, I guess, you know, when I think about anything being done for the first time or innovative, like you don't know what you don't know, right? So. Uh, um, <laughs> it's going to be hard for me not to look at Matt from Citibank in the front row here, who is the lender on the project, because he got a lot of panicked phone calls from me on this project, and <laughs> I think Mike got a few of those as well. Um, but part of the framing of why the kind of the pressure around the lift award that we received in June of last year is we had a hard deadline from the state to close the project by 12:31, and uh, and that we could not have any additional financing. So, of course, as soon as you looked at winning the award, we sort of realized we had a problem, right? Construction costs up, interest up, it worked. I know Natasha said, you know, your sources and uses should be balanced. Uh, they were not. Uh, <laughs> they worked when we put the application in, and when I did not understand exactly the challenge we were going to have to get this deal 
financed without tax credits. I thought it would be easier. It was actually harder. Um, so uh, with all of that, part of the problem was we needed a $12.8 million loan. So interesting on this deal, when you think about no tax credits, the construction loan and the perm loan were the exact same size needed. And for me, working in this industry for so long, it was hard for, to wrap my mind around because we were not uh, bridging equity, right? So, so we just needed a $12.8 million loan. And when I started calling around to all of our banking partners, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, CDP does quite a bit of uh, affordable housing development. We have a lot of banking relationships. And pretty quickly, I realized this deal did not fit into any box. Uh, it did not, with the fact that it did not have tax credits, it did not have tax-exempt debt to get a $12.8 million taxable permanent loan was a problem. So I'm not suggesting it doesn't exist. I am suggesting it's very difficult to get, and it's very difficult by the time I was realizing this to close by 1231. If you think about some of the opportunities that were out there, or agency debt opportunities, those take, like Freddie Fannie, they take much longer, and we had a hard deadline. So I'll run through a little bit um, of the, uh, you can go to the next. So some of the things I learned, again, when I you know, went into this, uh, oh, I guess I should say. So what that led us to was two things. One, we started asking ORC about recycling bonds. We started asking Natasha and others at OHCS, um, you know, if we could get tax exempt bonds, it opens up a whole bunch of financing opportunities for us and it allows us to close on the timeline we need, right? So we just started to ask, can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it? They got, I think, tired of us enough. They said, you can do it as a pilot. We'll let you try it. But again, you have to close on the same deadline and you have to use your own recycled bonds because the state doesn't have a recycled bond program. There are no state recycled bonds. We had to use our own. Um, so I'll explain that a little bit more, but as we, as we started to look at what we could do, we had a project in Gresham that was going to be converting, paying off tax-exempt bonds around the same time we needed to close this deal. So that's what ORC and others helped us understand, is we could actually recycle our own bonds. Um, but the main things, I think, and these are not things I learned day one. These are things I started to learn as we kind of marched this project forward. Uh, so it was a very uh, stressful last three months of the last <laughs> of last year around the holidays. I learned that to recycle bonds without a recycling bond program, Mike can I'm sure can explain more of this. Some states have a recycle program because Oregon doesn't, and we were recycling them ourselves. We had to convert our other project and close this project on the exact same day, or we would lose the bonds. And I thought, there's got to be an easier way to do that, you know? But it kept coming back to, nope, you got to do it on the exact same day. Um, so really what that meant is we had to queue up our deal in Gresham to be ready to convert and then hold it until we were ready to close this deal. So there was just a lot of logistics there, basically having calls with both financing teams of both projects trying to line this all up. It was very late in the game where I have a very stressful conversation with Matt about realizing I was so used to drawing down bonds, right? You close on your construction loan, you pick the drawdown option from OHCS, and you take the bonds down as you need them, and you pay interest as you take out the bonds. But in this case, uh, it's sort of funny to think back, but it was late that I realized, oh no, we will be taking down the bonds all in one day and paying interest on the full amount of bonds, which was not in our financial projections to pay interest like that. Luckily, Matt also explained to me, which led me back to ORIC, that we could invest the bonds. But of course, I didn't know how to do that, so that's a whole other story, um, which I'll probably get into later. But luckily, ORIC has a, I don't know if it's a subsidiary, BLX, 
uh, where they introduced me to someone that could you know, help me uh, figure out how, how to actually invest our bonds so we wouldn't just be uh, paying interest on those without getting anything in return. Go to the next, and I'll just walk you through some of the numbers. So one thing as I was preparing for this presentation, which was kind of hard to explain, but I really wanted to show kind of apples to apples, but it didn't exactly exist. And those are because of two things I kind of mentioned earlier. One is trying to find a lender that could do this on our timeline or a debt product that could deliver on our timeline. And then again, there's just kind of nothing ex like this, you know, realizing that the tax exemption market really opens you up to just all these, these other options. So uh, this is sort of the best I could do at trying to give you a real apples to apples of what it looked like for our project. And I broke it up between construction and perm because they really tell two very different stories uh, on what happened with the deal. So scenario one is what really happened. So as I mentioned, we had to recycle our own bonds uh, so you'll see we had tax exempt bonds of about 11.2 million because that's what we were paying off on our Gresh Gresham deal. That's the amount of tax exempt bonds we had available to recycle. And then we had to do a taxable portion of the loan, uh, that's the 1.6 million, to get to our total uh, loan. Uh, I show you the construction interest uh, that we uh, paid. We also, of course, under this model, under recycling the bonds, we had to pay the OHCS uh, bond fees and pay for the bond council. So that was roughly 235,000. And then as I mentioned, the investment income that we worked with the BLX group to actually invest our bonds because we didn't actually need them day one. Uh, and that we made, so that we have done the bond sale and uh, and those, or investment, and we did earn $418,000 on that investment. Uh, one other interesting part of the investment that we didn't, uh, we didn't anticipate, which again is part of that like learning as we go, is this deal also has a trustee account with US Bank, and, and that is also earning interest. So, our interest income is actually a little bit higher than that, but we won't know exactly what it is till the project is done. And scenario, scenario two is just showing you, uh, like again, if there would have been a, like a apples to apples taxable product, uh, you can see, and we were able to leverage the exact same amount of debt, 12.9 million. You can see the interest would have been lower even the though the interest rate is higher because we would have been able to draw it down as we needed it. We wouldn't have had to draw it all day one. Uh, so you can see uh, on the face of it, I think you look at this and you might conclude um, that it would have been better to go taxable. But again, it's not exactly a real, real product. Uh, but it's really the perm that I think starts to, to paint the picture of what the real benefit is. Um, we go to the next. Okay, so again, scenario one is, is real. Uh, that is the Citibank debt product that we use, the taxable 115 debt service coverage, 40-year amortization, and we leveraged what, you know, what we end up, up with, that 12.9 million. Um, scenario two would have been, again, a product that, uh, that would not have actually closed, I don't think, on our timeline, but would have, I think, been the best other, if we had more time, would have been our best other option if we had had to go taxable on the entire loan. And because of the debt service coverage and amortization, we would have only been able to leverage 11 and a half million. So even in, you know, in this case, we paid more interest on the construction side, we leveraged so much more money on the perm side. And to give you an idea of that sources and uses of balancing and kind of how much this, how important this was to leverage that additional, uh, you know, $1.4 million, we 
a couple other things we had to do to get the project to work and close by December 31st is OHCS invested lift, there's a 129 unit project, but they only invested lift in 113 of the units. They did not regulate the other units, so we set those for closing at 80% AMI, so those have, you know, we brought, we're able to bring a little bit more uh, income to the project, um, and, um, oh, I forgot what else I was, I lost my train of thought there. I know I have another uh, another piece of information for you, but anyhow, I think long story short, it was, as I said, a very kind of interesting realization for me with how much kind of I deal with affordable housing finance to realize that really there, it was just gonna be difficult if the state of Oregon, given the fact that we have so much more gap financing now, was gonna start doing more deals without low-income housing tax credits and without tax-exempt bonds, and we're talking larger deals, because I do think it's much easier to get small, taxable, permanent loans if you're talking a million or two million bucks. Uh, but if you're gonna try to do deals like this, it's very complicated, and I think they're just, a quite a bit of uncertainty and risk in terms of the way that we had to figure out, you know, how are we gonna invest the bonds? It, it, you know, we had to go through quite a bit of iteration with the BLX group on how long are we gonna invest it? How much per month do we need to release out of the investment? When we went to sell or invest the bonds, um, <coughs> We, it was a live process where we got offers and we had to pick right away. Um, and I remember myself and our director of finance sort of roaming around the room being like, we got one offer. We don't totally understand it. Like it's not in normal like layman's terms. <laughs> uh, and uh, oddly, that's true, the only investment offer we got was from Dinosaur Financial which I didn't, I felt like, <laughs> I felt like I was like, I was in a fraudulent bond sale <laughs> situation. And so we were trying to decide like, is this all legit? Like, do we do this? So it is, we do believe it is legitimate now. We've already, we've actually already been given our, our profit uh, from, from that. But, um, but I guess it's a long way of saying, I didn't feel like for our industry, doing the bond recycling was very replicable. Right? I mean, we had to have a deal that was paying off in about the same amount of bonds at the same time. Uh, we had to do quite a few things. You know, nobody in our company really understood. We had to really rely on a lot of people, uh, you know, outside experts. So, it, you know, it was just a fair amount of pain and suffering to try to make this deal work. Oh, I know what I was gonna say earlier. The other thing we had to do beyond doing uh, some units above 60% AMI, we have a 100% deferred fee. So we, we do not, we had to put our entire fee in. So, uh, and that's not something we would, you know, typically do, but, but that was the difference, right? Like this really, I would say, if I'm just talking round numbers, the, from going from uh, taxable bonds to tax exempt, it found us at least a million dollars, right? Where there was nothing else to give. You know, I mean, at that point, it was, you know, extremely important. Of course, I've had the benefit and other times in the cycles of real estate where we've had deals where, you know, you had another million dollars of, de you know, developer fee you could defer. You had more levers to pull. This one, we were, we were out of options. Um, and of course, assuming, if anything, I mean, still to this day, right, it's got another year of construction. If anything goes wrong, right, we'll be putting money into the deal. Like there's, there's just nothing left. Um, so it was really important for us. We're really excited that OHCS allowed us to do this. I personally uh, would love for my peers to get a chance to use this through a program <laughs> and not have to go through it the way uh, we did it. I remember our California coworkers who've used uh, recycled bonds before say, oh, it's easy, just works like anything else. Works like 
you know, any construction loan, any perm loan. <laughs> but, but again, they didn't know what they didn't know, I didn't know what I didn't know to realize, of course, in this instance, uh, it is very, uh, very unique. So it didn't, uh, nothing went from according to plan. We'd, I didn't even know what, you know what questions I should have asked. And Barbara from your office spent many, <laughs> many a phone call with me too, trying to make me believe uh, that's you know things like we had to convert and close on the exact same day. I still felt like there had to be another way, but um, but yeah. So again, I think I think it would be great for the state. I think that as it would obviously would work some projects like this, like new construction lift without tax credits, but. You know, I started my career in Oregon really working on preservation projects. I know we have the benefit in Oregon of having a lot of resources for new construction. I've been thinking this could be a real tool for preservation for deals that just need to be refinanced. I wonder about the projects that we've had low interest rates for so long. Uh, so I think about projects that may, you know, may have a you know, very low uh, interest rate and when they come to refinance and are faced with really high interest rates you know it's just a totally different dynamic in the in the realm of preservation and I think I to date had been really fortunate of the opposite I came into the industry when those deals were at 12 13 percent and I got to refinance them at six uh, and so it was just it just worked um, and I know you know people are going to obviously have a, a harder time preserving deals. So 60 basis points was the sort of I, where I started thinking the difference was on the taxable tax exempt. Of course, as I worked through this all, I realized there's all kinds of other you know, costs, but also other ways to make uh, in, you know, investment income. Um, so kind of lots of, lots of uh, ups and downs um, on this one. But but yeah, I think that's that's it. Do you want to take questions now, or later? I, I want to ask you a question. You have uh, an upper. Back up a slide. I want to. I want to underscore that there is an uppercase if. Can you talk uh, without throwing any other bankers under the bus? Uh, <laughs> can you talk about your experience in terms of taxable loans? And I know Matt came through for you at City on that. But can you talk about just the, the the challenges associated and what feedback you got in terms of banks willing to bite at the taxable versus the tax exempt? Yeah, and I'm sure there's a few bankers in here that could probably better answer that question. But but generally what I was surprised and didn't realize going into it uh, was just understanding that our industry on the 4% bond, so the larger projects, the larger loan amounts, has really been built around the, the tax exempt market. Right, and that, that, so there was all kinds of options there. But as soon as you went to the taxable, uh, I mean, I think it really ranged. I mean, some people just said, nope, not interested. And this is mostly on the permanent side, just not interested. We don't have any products of, for taxable loans of that size. Uh, some sent us, you know, started talking to us about the agency debt products, which again had just the challenges of, um, of timing and complications with that. And then others that do have taxable kind of balance sheet type products, but, but, but again, just not, not able to go this high, right? Like, so, um, so yeah, I mean, that's where I, I just remember thinking like, oh, like there's an actual gap in the market that like maybe OHCS, I think my first thought was like, OHCS is gonna have to create a, taxable <laughs> loan product. But really, I think the more, the, the easier thing to do at the end of the day, and I know it's not easy for the state of Oregon because I've been educated a little bit on what it means to sort of keep these bonds alive. There's a true cost to that, to the state if they do that. Other states have done it in, in ways that are actually, you know, pretty, pretty interesting, uh, but don't sound extremely straightforward, I'm sure. The ORIC team can, uh, you know, could help OHCS with that if they were going to do it. Um, but, but yeah, that, I think, my simplistic developer way to say it is there's just not a market for it that I could find. And I would just note, if you can actually, one thing I should have said, if you can go back one, I think it was one more slide. 
I think it is interesting too just to see like what happened that's the, the closing interest rates versus where we are today on our variable rate. Um, so that is, so we have a variable rate on the taxable. Um, so uh, of course that's, uh, which anyone doing a deal right now with a const variable construction uh, <laughs> rate loan knows. But, but it is kind of surprising that that was just from December of last year to now that that went up that much. So of course, not, not according to our projections. Great, thanks, thanks Jessica. Um, yeah, there were a few turns on that one, um, but it was your end, it's all a blur anyway, so, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> all right, um, I think a couple things just to note on this, and again, let's just kind of back up from what we talked about on the last session. The reason we have, we can recycle this cap is because you need this, you need to issue bonds to meet the 50% test for LIHTC purposes. Again, traditionally, that 50% amount is of senior tax exempt bonds is significantly higher than the amount the project will support. Uh, you know, what a rule of thumb is in terms of pay down at conversion, I'd say sort of 30, 40% is sort of a typical amount. So if you take, uh, you know, do, do the rough math back of the envelope, uh, there's a lot of cap out there, volume cap to be recycled because of the way the 50% test uh, works currently. So um, again, what we're doing here, just to, to summarize again, is converting short-term use of vo a volume cap to long-term use by reallocating at pay down or conversion of one project and then transferring or moving that volume cap from the paid down bonds to the newly issued bonds. And uh, yes, what we made Jessica do in terms of same day, same amount is the rules. That's what you have to do in the absence of a, what we call a recycling program on that. So just again, at a high level in terms of how this recycling works, um, five, five things to re remember here, and this does come from my tax counsel, so I have credibility in saying this as not a tax lawyer. Volume cap can be re recycled only once. The new loan must be made within six months of the repayment of the old loan. Now that assumes you have a program, and I'll talk about what a program is. Uh, the new loan must be made within four years of the closing of the original bond, so in this case, Jessica's Gresham project, the conversion had to occur within that time period. Uh, the new maturity of the bonds can't be more than 34 years from the original closing date of the bond, so you've got to get a limitation on your term on the bonds. Uh, QRRP stands for Qualified Residential Rental Project, okay? Just shorthand for tax lawyers on this. All the rules apply. It, it, does, it does not mean, however, that you have to move it from a new construction project to another new construction project. You can move it from a, from a new construction project, pay down at conversion to, hit your, to at conversion to your permanent mount, and move that into an acquisition rehab project. Again, the rules are that you have to, again, with these other rules, just, again, comply with the qualified residential, regil, residential rental project rules, which cover both acquisition rehab, preservation projects, as well as new construction projects. And just to be really clear here, uh, and this is a recurring theme, when you recycle the cap, the cap only generates tax credits once. So there's no way to recycle cap and get another round of tax credits. So in bold, tax exempt private activity bonds using recycle cap do not generate LIHTC. Thanks, Alex. Um, what are the opportunities here? Um, you know, as noted, uh, there's a significant amount of this cap available because of the way the 50% test works. Uh, if we're issuing four or five hundred million dollars of bonds each year, 30, 40 percent of that amount's being paid down at conversion. Thinking about the time frames, we've got a lot of capacity to issue private activity bonds, again, without volume cap, but um, with, um, with long-term tax exemption, which in a rising rate environment can be really significant in terms of, of savings, not so much on the short end, but certainly on the long end, that differential. Um, in California, Washington, several other states, they actually have a program, uh, when we talk about a recycling program, what that means is, in Jessica's instance, she had to take, CDP had to take cap from one project that they had and then apply it to a new project that they had, and, and developers like community development partners and a number of the pro pro uh, developers and sponsors have a number of transactions outstanding. And so if you can align conversion with new issuance, you can use your quote own volume cap and move it from one issue as a pay down to a new issue on that. That's not gonna work for everybody who doesn't have a, if you've got one project or not a big inventory of projects or those dates don't align. And so what we see is recycling cap programs 
And what that really means is the state housing agency puts together a recycling program, typically with a line of credit. And so when you pay down the bond, the bond is sort of held, if you would, or warehoused under an, a line of credit and then rolled back out when the new bond is issued. So the cap recycling program, along with just establishing the rules, is really just a financial instrument to preserve or keep your paid off bonds from your old issue outstanding or, quote, live until you roll those into your new issue or recycled issuance program on that. And while there can be some work in terms of putting those programs together, once they're up, as, as um, Jessica said, they're really pretty smooth in terms of the operation of that. And we certainly see with my colleagues in the state to the south, they do a lot of projects with recycled cap or some portion of recycled cap in a lot of transactions on that. And um, uh, that's how they work. Going back to the point that uh, a recycled issue has to, has, to, has to meet the qualified residential res residential rental product rules on that. What that means is you have a lot of flexibility in terms of your tax compliance on this, in terms of your affordability levels. Because remember, a ta under 142 and these private activity bonds, your minimum rental requirements, again, I'm just speaking on the bond side, is 20 at 50, 20% 20 of units at 50% AMI or below, or 40% of units at 60% AMI or below. That's your tax requirement. That's your tax test. So as we talked about in the prior session, you can see a lot of things where you could do mixed income. You could have some market rate uh, in that mix as well and still be in full compliance with your tax, your federal tax requirements on that. Now, of course, other resources bring other restrictions into the project in terms of affordability, AMI, rent levels, and so forth on that. So again, there's a lot of flexibility from a federal tax standpoint in terms of using CAP, in terms of having a lot of flexibility in terms of your targeted market and AMI levels as well on that. Um, as Jessica pointed out, and we've, we've seen that we see this in a number of contexts, sometimes it's not a question of tax exempt versus taxable, it's just a question of do I have someone who will make my loan uh, on that. And we see that in a number of contexts outside of the housing context where we'll have a transaction where we've got a significant tax exempt issuance amount and then we've got what we call a taxable tail. And there's no problem selling the tax exempt bond, but you've got a million dollar or $500,000 taxable tail and no one will buy it. So this could be a question of both cost of capital and access to capital as well, both play into that. Um, the conversations that we've had uh, with a number of, uh, of clients and others is this recycling thing is complicated. There's a lot of bells and whistles. You have to draw down everything at once. You've got to align. If you don't have a recycling program, what do you do? And you've got to make all this alignment. There's some costs and expensive. You've got reinvestment. You can't draw down, so forth. So there's a lot of complexity around that. And so the question then becomes, well, and we're going to talk about 501c3 bonds, wouldn't it just be easier to just forget about the whole volume cap thing anyway and just go to a 501c3 bond on that? And the answer is maybe, but remember that a, 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 a recycled cap private activity bond allows for private for-profit ownership. And so you can put together more traditional real estate capital stacks in terms of real equity investment traditional equity investment, senior subordinate debt. There's a number of things you can do with a great deal more of flexibility in terms of designing your capital stack under a recycled bond issue that you can't do under a 501c3. A 501c3 bond ha project has to be owned and operated, owned by uh, the 501c3, so no equity interest from some third party on that. There's ways to, there's some workarounds in terms of subordinate debt and cash flow debt and other kinds of things, but the recycled bond allows for for-profit ownership of the project, which allows you to potentially structure greater flexibility in structuring your capital. All right, let's pause there uh, before we talk, jump into 501c3 bonds and see if there's any questions on recycled volume cap. Yes, Russ. Oh. Yeah, I actually had a two-parter uh, about the developer fee. Uh, you had indicated that you deferred your entire fee uh, and I'm curious if that was related to any requirements around the funding or lending uh, and the recycling, or if that was just how you made your sources and uses balance. Uh, and then uh, the second part to that is, 
Um, given that you didn't then have any cash fee, were there concerns that you had to address in underwriting either through guarantees or, or other things, whereas a cash developer fee sometimes is a contingency item of last resort for your lender? Yeah, so it, it is interesting. So really, we deferred all of the fee because we had to make the deal pencil. That was the way to do it. And then one thing that was, I talked about a lot of the things that were more difficult by not having tax credits involved. One thing that was easier, not having tax credits involved, is the risk assessment of the deal, right? So there were none of the conversations of sort of like, uh, how are we going to make sure the you know the construction loan is paid off and all of that? It was all Citibank construction to perm, so we you know that was very unique right for us. Like we just typically we have three right a construction lender, equity investor, perm lender. They all have their own requirements and then they all want to make each other feel good about it right. So you get all of those you know things around how much uh, risk mitigants are are in the deal. Um, in this case, uh, Citibank allowed us to uh, to defer the entire fee with no special, you know, just normal guarantee type uh, situation, nothing unique. I do think part of the, if you look, take a longer term view of this deal, right, it's uh, 113 units are at 60% AMI and the rest are at 80. And so if you look at the cash flowing portion of a project of that size at the AMI, it's not what I think myself and most people in this room are, are used to. So I think it looked, it feels really risky on the front end of it to be a developer and have no developer fee. But if you look at the, the way it should operate over time, uh, that then it, you know, it doesn't look so risky. Is there another question? Uh, how did you end up with a tax exempt and a taxable piece on your financing? Uh, Jessica, that was just simply the amount of volume cap that was available to be moved from the Gresham project to the to the Salem project. Is that right, Jess? Correct. Yeah. Is the same lender? Yeah. So it's just a taxable tail. Which is part of the challenge in terms of recycling your own cap. Uh, on that, so if we had a warehouse program and you know a recycling program, then you could simply recycle what you needed as opposed to simply what you had in your queue based on your next conversion. Great. Yes, hi, Jen. So, so given the fact that we're coming off this period where we've had sort of bond cap in the bank that we've now spent down, given the timing limitations on when you can use this. If Oregon Housing was to create a program, the time would be best served now. Yes, <laughs> yes, and I, and I have it on authority from, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I have it, I, ha I asked, I, I, I asked the, the debt manager at, at, at uh, uh, Housing, I said, we're gonna talk about volume cap recycling, what can I say? And he said, we are supportive, if there is a demand and a need, we will explore a program. So again, if there's a need out there, um, you know, again, there's a 501c3 tax exemption option, there's a recycling option out there. So, I mean, this is to, to Natasha's earlier point, this is where, I won't speak for the department, uh, but this is where we need to, if, if there's a need and this is a valuable tool, there's precedent and there's models to create very efficient recycling programs, but we can't create a program and then not have anyone use it given we live in a scarce resources environment. Okay. Oh, Jill. You talked about the fact that there's the 80-20, so um, it was what, 20% had to be at 50% AMI and 40% at 60% AMI. That's, that's an alternative test. So again, for federal tax purposes, the recycled bonds have to qualify with qualified residential rental property rules on that, and that imposes, again, for federal bond tax exempt purposes on that, your, your AMI, your, your income limits, 20% of units at 50% or below, or 40% at 60 and below. So technically, if we were at a 40% at 60%, that means the balance of the building, the 60% can be at 100% AMI? 
Could be a market rate. It could be a market rate. Could be a market rate, yes. Again, unless you had other funds in the project unrelated that imposed limitations on uh, either rents or income outside. Uh, this is just a federal tax requirement. So technically, this could be a way to get, uh, you can call it the middle income housing mixed in with low income housing. Yes, yes, with private for-profit ownership. And did the building, could it, did it have to be condominiumized or was it single project? I'll let Jessica speak to that, but for purposes of doing a recycled project, you would not need to split the 20% of units from the 80% of units. You want to talk about your 60 and 80% units? Just the question if they had to be condoed? No. No. I mean, I think this, uh, back to kind of like where this deal was more simple, uh, is uh, there's no eligible basis, there's no tax credits, right? So we really just had to do our regulatory agreement, the lift regulatory agreement with OHCS, which was only on the 113 60% uh, AMI units. Uh, and then Citibank just underwrote and financed the, the whole project for construction and, and PERM. Uh, so there was no, uh, the, the most complicated thing here was really that, that bond recycling. There's no condo. Um, nothing, nothing else unique like that. And I would just note, Mike, you said a couple times that um, that in the recycling, that that private for profits, but nonprofits can use it as well. Yeah, just wanted to make sure. Yeah, it's just I just want to make the point that you can have for profit ownership in the recycled arena, and we're going to talk about five hundred one c three bonds uh, here in a minute, which requires again ownership by the five hundred one c three. Yes. I brought my own microphone. No, awesome. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> she gave it to me. Um, with this 80-20 uh, project, though, would the DOJ allow for that with the recycling? I, you know, right? The um, yeah, that's a good point. I'm trying to remember. Did we get statutory reform on the mixed income? Okay. Yeah, we'd need to we'd need to revisit our. Our, TBD our, then our okay. statutory our statutory caps yeah. on mixed income yes okay. thank you good reminder okay all right so I'm gonna do a shameless pitch again um, this is a nice little trifold called financing affordable housing without tax credits and I'm I'm I've like visuals on this and so uh, Come get a copy of this. This is like super helpful streamlining. Okay, how do you do tax exempt bonds with volume cap, without volume cap, with tax credits, without tax credits, governmental 501c3. This is terrific. I did not write it, uh, so it's really good. Uh, and uh, But my colleagues, my tax and other colleagues put this together. It's a great quick reference and a visual in terms of all the things we're talking about today. And I think, again, it kind of tries to simplify the paths uh, on this with some basic questions and outlines on that. So we've got a good stack of them here. So I encourage you to uh, to grab those. It's a great visual in terms of some of the sort of visualizing some of the, um, the elements and components of these uh, financing structures that we're talking about here. There certainly is rising interest in using 501c3 bonds. Uh, 501c3 bonds, again, we're talking about bonds issued for the benefit of a nonprofit entity. These come in various shapes and sizes depending on the shape and size of your nonprofit who's benefiting from these bonds. They can be used to provide tax exempt financing. They can also be used to provide bridge financing. I think Jessica's point in terms of access and what we see in not only in the housing context but the other context that in terms of pool of lenders who can, can buy and purchase tax exempt bonds versus taxable bonds, that's a real and significant uh, market distinction out there. So it's again, it's it's an issue of both access to capital and cost of capital. So sometimes the cost might not be uh, enough to generate the additional transaction costs and other things, but it may also be an opportunity to actually access capital as well. Um, a 501c3 does not issue tax exempt bonds directly. They issue those through a conduit issuer. Um, again, depending on your 501c3 entity, if you were to issue conduit revenue bonds for a housing project in Oregon, OHCS might be able to issue them. It would depend on the AMI limits. A, uh, OHCS is limited to 80% AMI. This is throughout where it's chapter 456, so there's a cap on that. But if you want to do things higher than that, we have a very productive 
issuance authority that issues for a range of nonprofits called the Oregon Facilities Authority, which has broad issuance authority for any nonprofits as long as you're issuing pursuant to your exempt purpose. So there's both local and other national. There's, you've got a number of issuer options out there uh, in terms of the issuance. But again, it's a public-private partnership where a governmental issue, issuer issues on behalf of or for the benefit of in what we call a conduit or pass-through transactions. And again, I don't want to beat the dead horse here, but tax-exempt 501c3 bonds like recycled volume caps do not generate additional LIHTC. Okay. Um, we see 501c3 bonds. There's nothing new about 501c3 bonds. There may be some new developments in using 501c3 bonds uh, for middle housing or other kinds of things, but this is a tried and tested tool that's used across the public finance, municipal finance markets on this. Uh, 501c3 bonds have been used for affordable housing projects outside of the LIHTC context, subject to internal re revenue code limitations. Now, for a, f and I'll, I'll not skip, I'll got this, I'll get the, the, rent the income limits a little bit later. We also see 501c3 bonds used for senior living and student housing projects without income limits. And we see workforce, and we see 501c3 bonds used for workforce housing and also housing, uh, workforce housing for special purpose entities uh, and, in, and for, um, think about a school or a university that might want to do housing to house staff or, or others on that. And then the area where we're spending a lot of time currently in our firm is workforce housing for special purpose 501c3s lessening the burdens of government. And again, that bold at the end, you all know now that 501c3 bonds don't generate tax credits. Okay, we're clear there. All right, very good. All right. So um, again, this is just getting the weeds a little bit in terms of the internal revenue code uh, on this. Um, essentially two, maybe three ways to sort of look at the 501c3 charitable purpose. So again, when you're issuing 501c3 bonds through a governmental or conduit issuer, or not, they have to be issued in furtherance of the exempt purpose of the 501c3 entity. So the conversation that I've had more than once, I've had it a lot in the last few months when we start looking at volume cap constraints are, oh, I formed a 501c3, can I issue workforce or middle housing bonds. And then I ask, and my tax people ask, um, what is the purpose of your 501c3? Oh, it's kind of housing generally. Uh, can we see your 1023? Oh, it's really old. I don't know where it's at. Well, what's your exempt purpose? Well, I've got a determination letter, OK? So this is really specific stuff. This isn't is sort of generality. You go, well, I think this is a good thing. Therefore, it's lessening the burdens of government, or yeah, it's affordable. It's, it's housing related, so therefore, it should be OK. The IRS rules are very strict in terms of what is the exempt purpose, and bonds have to be issued on a tax-exempt basis in furtherance of that exempt purpose. So just a little behind the scenes on what has to happen here in terms of issuing these bonds. So among the lawyers and other professionals in the deals, you have a governmental entity that has statutory powers to issue bonds for the benefit of 501c3 nonprofit organizations in furtherance of their exempt purpose. We, as bond counsel, issue an opinion to the investor that says the interest on these bonds is tax exempt. We also say the bonds are validly issued meaning that the issuer, the governmental issuer, has authority to issue them. They've checked all the boxes in terms of procedures, process, powers, et cetera, on that. In terms of being able to say that the bonds are issued on a tax-exempt basis, the interest is uh, excluded from gross income from federal tax purposes, they're tax-exempt, therefore lower cost interest, we have to be able, again, to conclude that, that those bonds are in furtherance of that 501c3's purpose, which brings in another set of lawyers. And sometimes that's us, too, different, depending on which jurisdiction we're in. And we have to give a tax exemption opinion saying what is the exempt purpose or that the purpose of the bonds is consistent with the exempt purpose of the 501c3 nonprofit that's, whose bonds are being issued for their benefit on. Now, you can see if you don't have the history and you don't have the documentation, it's not a, oh, trust me, I think this is OK. It should be OK. It seems like a good purpose. You really have to dig in and understand what is the exempt purpose of that 501c3. And in certain instances, we've said, you don't have enough information here. There's no mechanism to sort of change the purpose of a 501c3 entity. You really have to create a new one. And so this work around formation is really critical and important to do it right if you're going to go down this path of 501c3 bonds. 
So 501c3 bonds, typically we're talking about a traditional affordable rental housing for uh, 501c3 nonprofit purposes is rece receiving the poor and the distressed and the underprivileged. That means as a general rule, again, your income test, 20% of units at 50% of area median income or 40% of units at 60% of area median income and 75% of units at 80% of area median income. That's if you're a 501, a traditional 501c3 affordable housing. The alternative test plus the 75% of units at 80% of area median income. So again, you still have some capacity there to do mixed income from a federal tax standpoint. You could have up to 20% of your units could be fully market rate units in that scenario. Lessening the burdens of government. I'm going to just put that a pause in that, and, and, and I'll come back to that in terms of what that means and, and work through that a little bit with all of you. Um, other purpose, there's some other purposes in terms of recognized exempt purposes. We'd certainly see, um, you know, if you're, for example, if you're a hospital, if you're a university, if you're a school and you're building housing for your healthcare workers, your teachers, or others on that, that's, again, that would be in furtherance of your exempt purpose. Uh, because that housing is advancing your exempt charitable purpose on that. So let's look at my example here from my favorite tax lawyer on this XYZ charity has relief for the poor, distressed, underprivileged as a charitable purpose. It'd like to build a new market, market rate workforce housing in a distressed community that helps for additional economic development. The provision of the market rate housing is not subject to set-asides and is not, so you can see that, okay? It's just, it's just the case that while this is a good thing, it's not within the scope and within the parameters of the charitable exempt purpose for that entity. Okay. Um, again, I think I've covered this in terms of the 501c3. These are just some basic requirements for 501c3 bonds. Um, again, I think that third bullet point is really a key here. Providing housing by itself is not an inherently charitable purpose. You really have to analyze who gets to live here, okay? So, um, you know, a lot of the conversations we have with, with developers and bankers or others who are looking at projects on this is, you know, I, they see the advantages of tax-exempt financing, they may want to navigate to make sure they've got a property tax exemption. Those are two of the key levers in terms of making projects pencil on that. And then they start speculating as well, do I need to be at 80% AMI? Do I need to target sp a specific community of workers on that? And what we typically say is, who do you want to live there? Sort of start with that. Who is your targeted population that's going to live in your community? And then you figure out your financing options based on that targeted community as well. Um, I just add, again, uh, next slide on here. Just, just note that the safe harbor under this Rev Proc 9632 Okay. Oh, I'm back. All right. Um, okay. Lessening the burdens of government. This is this is kind of the hot. This is the hot topic around housing and and bond financing for housing. On this, alleviate or lessen. Okay, that's what it means. Alleviate or lessen. This is a key part. Local government must recognize activity as a public sector responsibility or obligation. So. You want to form a new 501c3, you want to do middle or workforce housing or affordable housing or mixed or whatever it might be on this, and you put together your 1023, that's your, your, your document that goes to the IRS and say, I'd like to be recognized as a nonprofit charitable entity on this. You have to go to your city, your local housing authority, and you need to have a real and substantive conversation about what the housing needs are in that community in hand in hand and get, you know, you've got to be on the same page. Now, if the housing authority says, yeah, we've got a need, this is a great idea, can you help us with it? That's not sufficient. It has to be, an, a, the, the housing authority or the city needs to demonstrate some affirmative action taken, some forward steps, actual commitment to addressing the issue. Not just that it's a need and it's somebody else's need, but it's our obligation and you can do this in furtherance, and these actions by the 501c3 are in furtherance of that and thereby lessening or alleviating the burdens of government. 
in one of the 501 special purpose 501c3s we formed uh, about a year and a half ago on this. We, ORIC, were, were uh, special tax counsel working with collaboratively with bond counsel on that. And as the 1023 was going into the IRS, we had to really scrutinize where the local housing authority was, what was lessening the burdens, what actions had been taken by the local housing authority, and really had to, again, cross the T's and dot the I's to make sure this was truly a lessening of burdens of government. In that case, our firm actually gave the opinion that said the bond issuance was in furtherance of the exempt purpose. We had another firm acting as bond counsel. So again, it's important to pay attention to the details, and lessening the burdens has to be real and substantive and, um, and meaningful on that. Um, and we've got um, we've got a um, we've got another two applications in another jurisdiction that we're working on right now. Uh, interestingly, in that case, uh, the 501c the developer the sponsor who's forming the 501c3 doesn't want to form a 501c for every new project they do in the state. So we are seeking IRS approval of a statewide special purpose 501c3 lessening the burdens of government, and we've baked into it a process by which before each bond is issued, we would go to a local jurisdiction, housing authority, city, county, and we would make that finding and determination as to what is lessening the burdens of government for the workforce project on that. Now, we're not successful there yet. I hope we are because it would be nice to have a 501c3 with jurisdiction to do projects across an entire state. This is a state not unlike Oregon that has major metropolitan centers and rural uh, places as well. And so going in and saying, Workforce development means 80% AMI or 120% AMI can look very, very different from community to community. So our effort there is to put together a 501c3 and we're hopefully with, with, again, with some standards and parameters in it that we can have a statewide entity. So that's an interesting development. We hope that uh, we're successful there. Um, next slide, just some general considerations on 501c3 bonds. Because the 501c3 bonds, because you have these tests uh, that are fairly flexible in terms of your AMI requirements. They typically typically do allow you to have higher rates than uh, bonds requiring uh, volume cap uh, on these, again, just because of these tests and parameters that, that you have, again, for Fed, I'm talking only for federal tax purposes on this. Where, and this is, goes back to the comment about the recycled bonds. If you have a recycled bonds, that allows for for-profit ownership. If you have a 501c3 bond, the nonprofit has to own the project. So if, you, if you're looking together to put together a capital stack, you're doing a 501c3 bond, and the 501c3 bond says, I'm going to have this much in senior debt, I'm going to have this much in subordinate debt, and oh, I've got a great development partner who's going to put in this much in equity in the transaction. Well, that equity is ownership, and you just blew your 501c3 qualification on that, okay? Now, what you could do is that funder who's going to bring the, quote, equity into the deal. You can structure that as cash flow debt, soft debt, various other kinds of debt, but it has to be real debt, okay? So that's probably one of the most important factors when you're thinking about a 501c3 project is how you form your capital stack, and again, ownership, 100% in the nonprofit entity as well. And again, this is why I think it makes sense to consider in our state having both a recycled cap program and a 501c3 program on this. Um, again, the, the, other, the other lever we typically see of these deals is just long-term tax exempt interest, and then the property tax abatement. Of course, the property tax abatement varies from state to state and sometimes jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So let me pause there and see if there's any questions on 501c3 bonding and how it might be used. Okay, you have one from the chat. Yes. Do housing needs studies done at the county or city level count to demonstrate the public sector responsibility or obligation? They are certainly very helpful. I'm talking to a, a, a developer and a potential funder in another jurisdiction outside of the state right now, and the question was, I think this should be at 120, 120% AMI. And there's studies on this and shows this is the need in terms of workforce or middle housing. I said, hey, that's a great fact. But it's only part of the equation. The other part of the equation is what is that jurisdiction? It's, it's not just about identifying the need. The jurisdiction has to be committed and taking some affirmative steps 
to address that need, whether that's a funding program, or that's property tax relief, or that's expedited permitting. It could be any number of things, but there has to be an affirmative action or step being taken by the jurisdiction. Not defining the need is, is critical, but advancing and addressing the need as well, again, under a lessening the burdens theory. Great. Yes? Do you mind holding till I get back there so the Zoom audience can hear your question? I'm sorry. Sorry about that. A lot of your um, high cost, like um, resort type communities in various states, have started developing land programs where they contribute land in the community to a developer who will provide housing this 80 to 120 percent AMI. Would that activity on their behalf indicate to that area that that would be a charitable answer, purpose then? Answer yes, and we've done that, and we went as high as 140. <coughs> so the answer is yes, very much yes. And that's a, that's a very, th that's an ideal situation in terms of where the special purpose lessening the burdens can get you to a 501c3 hand in hand with your public partner, so yes. Lynn? Hi, Mike. Can you have more than one nonprofit owner in this deal? Like, could there be a second nonprofit uh, contributing equity, or is that just a no-go? Hmm. You'd have to have the uh, they'd have to have the same exempt purpose. I need to, Lynn. I need to think about that in terms of what the collaboration looked like. Whether you'd have a single owner and then some other agreements that pass tax tests and muster on that, or whether you could actually do it as a co-nonprofit joint venture. I'd be inclined to say create a new entity and deal with the governance separately, but I don't know the answer to that. The, the, the exempt purposes would have to align, though, for sure. We can talk. Okay. Other questions? All right. Again, this is very much an emerging area, um, and a lot of, a lot of uh, folks we're talking to, uh, again, there's strong interest. Obviously, there's a lot of flexibility here in terms of getting long-term tax-exempt interest. And again, figuring out what your exempt purpose is, is as your 501c3. Now, I would note that um, you know if you're an existing 501c3 and you're doing affordable housing and you want to do middle housing, don't assume because you do affordable housing you can do middle housing. Have your council, your tax council, uh, look at your revisit your exempt purpose and see. And again, you can't you can't. There's actually I thought this. You can't change your exempt purpose. You got to you got to start over and create a new one. You can't sort of amend or evolve your exempt purpose. You have to create a new entity. And again, that's not terribly difficult. Uh, it just takes some time uh, to put that together. So, if you're uh, existing 501c3 providing affordable housing and you want to get into the space, threshold question part one is: Is this within the scope of my exempt purpose? Start there, and move move from that point. Okay. Terrific. All right. Uh, just some observations here in terms of uh, in terms of some things that we're seeing uh, that might be of interest uh, out there as you look at at financing options um, on, on projects. The very very high percentage <coughs> of transactions that we work on as bond council, certainly in Oregon, are bank direct purchase issues where you've got a bank uh, driven by CRA and other. Uh, motivations in terms of investing in affordable housing um, will come in with a um, you know with a, a construction loan as Jessica talked about it's typically a drawdown for interest cost savings and so forth on that uh, that's the vast majority of the transactions we see ease of execution and otherwise but we are increasingly seeing in certain instances capital markets transactions that is a bond underwriter put together an offering document, sell the bonds into the public market or a limited offering market on that. Uh, the long-term bond market can tend to be much more favorable. It can vary in terms of types of when we're talking about unrated credits like we would here. There can be a lot of fluctuation in terms of just market availability and so forth, but we are increasingly seeing projects in the right circumstances going to the capital markets to get longer-term debt more lighter on covenants and other kinds of things. We're also seeing transactions where we're seeing uh, senior and subordinate structures with a senior bond uh, being placed with one set of investors uh, and a subordinate bond being placed with another investor. We're working on a project right now, not in Oregon, where there's a high level of project-based vouchers. 
in the deal. And so the underwriters are approaching that transaction with a senior secured bond and a subordinate uh, secured bond, but interest is payable on a current basis on the senior bonds, uh, interest is payable on a cash flow basis on the junior bonds, and then excess cash flow amortizes the senior bonds, and the junior bonds get no amortization until the senior bonds are paid. And we think that's going to fly in the marketplace. I don't think the bankers, I don't think uh, the bankers are going to sign up for that. But the capital markets transaction, they can. So again, in certain instances, the senior subordinate or cash flow or other structures may be uh, may be uh, possible on this. The other thing I would note, and, and when you're doing that, you obviously want to make sure the um, there's real benefit to that as well because you're doing a securities offering. There's more liability, particularly for your public partner in doing that. Uh, we're running a little short on time, but I do want to mention just a couple other things that we're seeing out that I think these are these go in. I don't want to say wackadoodle in terms of our our, our arms, but I think real in, real in, real innovations out there that I think have some real possibility for replication out there. Again, we're spending a lot of time uh, creating these, uh, working with developers, and actually, as I say, have some applications in, and have actually created these special purpose limiting the burdens of government 501c3 entities out there. Um, those can be formed by uh, you know, any number of, 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 uh, of sponsors in terms of creating that as well. Um, and um, again, that seems to be a very, very flexible tool out there. Um, we, we did a project that we're just absolutely thrilled with where we did this in collaboration with a city, a town, a housing authority, a hospital, and a school. It was a small pilot project, but really innovative in terms of a true community-based uh, project with the special purpose 501c3 where the public entities came away and said, okay, we've started, we've, we've got a model to address our housing needs, and oh, we didn't, we, the public entities, didn't have to be the developer. They don't have to be the landlord. Uh, they didn't, you know, they put some money, they put some resources into it, but there was, was a way to do these in terms of some very, uh, very effective and creative public-private partnerships and really community collaborations as well. We're having some very interesting discussions right now with a school district and a city uh, where the school district has excess land. Uh, it's in a community where it's hard to recruit teachers. Uh, and they're saying, hey, if we give the land developer, what can you do on this? And so uh, as we look at those and you look at sort of in, uh, these community-based collaborations, if the school has land, the city can expedite permitting. There may be some other pre-development or other funding that go into the mix. If you look at the rent levels uh, to move those rents beyond 60 or 80 or wherever you need to make the project actually work in that arrangement, there's also scenarios where you can use tax-exempt financing and the employers could actually invest for a right to rent now that's subject to fair housing and some other complexities, but that's a really interesting development that we've seen where employers, certain public and nonprofit employers can actually buy bonds in exchange for a right to rent. Now again, there's fair housing and some other tax limitations on that, but that's a pretty sweet deal if you're an employer in a community and you desperately need teacher housing, healthcare worker housing, or other housing where you can invest in a debt instrument that's going to pay you back and you don't have to be the developer you don't have to be the owner, you don't have to be the landlord, but you can get a right to rent out of that. And so we've seen that used, and I think that's something that's very much ripe for replication as we move forward on this. So again, there's a lot of opportunities in terms of what we refer to. Don't, don't let P3 sort of scare you. Uh, all housing deals, all conduit housing deals are P3s by their very nature on this, but think more in terms of community partner collaborations as we move forward on this. So again, there's a lot of interesting things out there. And just to reiterate the theme, inter innovation is really key. And I know Natasha and her team are interested in, in, in dialogue and communication with all of the partners out there in terms of how we are responsible stewards for these public funds, how we maximize the leverage of these public funds, and we continue to maximize the, the production that we've had, and we continue with the momentum that's been built over the last several years. So I want to thank, uh, thank all of you for being here. I want to thank Natasha and Jessica for being part of the panel, as well as my colleagues Alex and Steve being part of this and putting all of this together. Uh, it's truly a privilege in terms of our work to work with so many of you, uh, bright, capable, committed people. Housing matters. I think that was the old OHCS theme a couple years ago with the little blue person, I think, Natasha. What we do matters, and it, abs it absolutely does. So keep up the good work, and uh, we look forward to talking to many of you. And if there's any final questions, happy to answer those before we adjourn.
Any final questions? Okay, shameless, again, shameless pitch for the trifold uh, on bond issuance on that, uh, the green book, second green book coming on that. Uh, thank you very much.